So when you find the story of Tamika Houston, um, which is such a tragic story, why did you say, I want to tell this story? Well, um, Tamika, because she was 24 when she passed away in the picture, it looks like a picture of the girls I went to school with in Girls High. Mm. And I know her. I know that press and set. I know, you know, her ambitions and how she presented herself. I know the little catch in her voice and, you know, that kind of move. But I also thought the idea of somebody telling a story in an audio way and just hearing a very intimate conversation between the people who experienced it, as opposed to short docs or features that are inside of a larger sort of context, would be interesting. And what could we could do for that? So really, it just comes out of curiosity, Teray. I'm, I'm a curious person. They asked me to do it. I usually say yes to things, especially because I, I haven't gone to school for these things. I just get thrown in the deep end and I do the best I can. But I, I imagine, really, it was because Tamika looked like she could have been me, but also um, the way she died was so horrific. And I have a thing about, I, I think black women and girls, we don't know who they are. Forget if they go missing. We never really see them. We see a set of characteristics that we apply. And I think the only people who really know who they are, are black men and uh, who've been raised by them and see outside of these things that they say strong, oh, they're sassy, oh, they're, you know, this or that. They're like, no, my mama was delicate. My mom had dreams. She, you know, she's as delicate as Scarlett Johansson. Why are we seeing girls and women before they go missing? And, and so anyway, this was my opportunity well, to tell the story. Yeah, there's several issues swirling within the Tamika story. Um, one of them is uh, domestic partner violence mm -hmm. and how women are very vulnerable and at risk to being murdered or you know, very badly hurt by the person they love the most. And this was a newer relationship for, for her and her killer, but they were together and they get into a fight and he kills her. And it's just so, so tragic to think about the person you need to be the most nervous about is the person who you love and share a home with. Yeah, except this person she did neither love or share a home with. That's what's also telling is that sometimes we take up with people that we have not really truly vetted for very specific reasons. Sure. The reason why this is interesting for me is that Tamika had a relationship with Terrence that was much more stable. She knew who he was and everybody knew that Terrence was, you know, real comic and kind of goofy and wacky, but he was also a real sweetheart and everybody speaks to that. But this one was somebody that no, none of her friends knew or her family. And I think that sometimes we temporarily might give ourselves over to relationships that we know are not good for us. But if our family hasn't met them or our best friends, that means she was hiding him. That means that there was a relationship outside of something that was normal. And I think that we do that often. And I say we for gain, material gain, or something you think that person's gonna give you. So they might've had relationships together, uh, you know, or, or, in, an intimate relationship, but or, they or were perhaps, not- Or perhaps were not because you best. know this guy, there's red flags here, but I like him. So I'm not, if, but if I start to introduce him to my world, my friends and my family would go like, excuse me, are you, are you ignoring all these red flags? Exactly, exactly. And that's what happened. But I think that it was an opportunity that they were both inside. In fact, Tamika said she was a hustler. And we also, again, we support this idea of go get the bag, be a hustler, do what you need to do to, that's absurd when it comes to how vulnerable black women are out there. You getting the hustle on and you're looking a certain way and you think she's four foot 11 and you think you're gonna out hustle these people. You might be smarter than them, but you can't overpower them. You can't overwhelm them. And often you are in a position to be assaulted and let alone murdered. She, she had an iron throne at her head and that killed her. Do you think that, and maybe this doesn't even matter, but do you think that he was trying to kill her 
or, you know, in a moment of arguing and anger, he threw something at her and like, oh my God, I didn't mean to hit her. And, but, but now she's dead. Um, Christopher Hampton is a very complicated individual and I can't speak to his mental wellness, but I can say that I was horrified by him in this way. At one point he would speak like he did it. Then another point he would say, I hope they found the person who, who did it. Then he would change the story. It's not an iron. I shot her, you know, all this other stuff. He came back and took off half her skull. What was that right. about? Was he right. trying to hide what he really did? Would it look more like rage if they saw that? So I just think that, um, I don't know what was going on with him. All I know is that um, she bled out in the closet. And if he did it as an accident, he had no presence of mind to not only uh, call the police or any sort of ambulance and explain it, but then afterwards he went and got another young girl and had sex in the room that day. So mm. what can you, what does that say? That mm. she was with somebody who was evil in a way. I'm sorry. There's, there's intentions that are evil. There's things that get out of hand and then there's, there's darkness, real darkness. And then, so that part, but also what you talk about, what others have talked about around the Tamika situation is that media and law enforcement gives less energy and attention to the missing black woman versus the missing white woman. And that affects how often they're found and how quickly they're found. Right, and that speaks to value. So everybody knows that we've been on a 20 year obsession with John Bonet Ramsey. It's like, we can't get off that roller coaster. That little girl died horribly and tragically. She deserves for them to find her killer. But this is an obsession that they have with the so-called mythological presence of these blonde hair, blue eyes, icons of, of white um, superiority, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You don't look for people that you don't care about. So of course, they're not going to look for her as beautiful as Tamika was. And you can see she was a doll baby. Um, she had Rebecca Howard, her aunt, who was a PR specialist. Desmond Howard is, she's married to Desmond Howard, a Heisman Trophy winner, could get no national press. They only got support from the black press. And Rebecca always thanks them and says they were the first people to care and spread this, the word as best they could. But when the person's missing, you need that national coverage to go as quickly as possible so you can get tips. And in fact, by the time they did get a tip from their first national co big coverage, the, the girl that called in said, I saw the reenactment and that's not what, how the room looked. She, they would have never found her if she had not been looking at the big three TV. One of the things that alerted the family was the dog. Her beloved dog had been left alone, had just yeah. given birth. And that told the family, no, 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 no. She wouldn't have left without her dog. That dog was like a child to her. And the dog um, becomes a huge issue for you. And there's this incredibly dramatic moment where you are kind of crying over the dog being abandoned, which of course is a symbol for Tamika. Something clearly terrible. You're like, you know, I, this is clearly beyond intuition. We now know something terrible. And you're, you're, you're crying. It's very moving. I'm wondering, did that audio moment happen in the moment? And so, so you were truly like, I am feeling this right now and recording this, or did you summon that, you know, almost as an actor later to say like, this is how I felt in that moment, but I'm, I'm recreating it. No, that's how I felt in the moment. In fact, just you talking of this almost too much to think about because anyway, <clears throat> it's just awful. And I think that, uh, <clears throat> I just allowed myself to be present. That's all I try to do when I perform or do anything. I go through all sorts of <clears throat> discussions with myself to try not to suppress my emotions because I need them. I need to be human. Um, 
I need to be human sometimes on cue, but I also need to allow myself to feel so I don't build up the habit of suppressing it because we do that so often as black people. We're overwhelmed with emotion. And we're always trying to balance what's appropriate. All I know is that reading that, even though I wrote those words, if anything, we cut short how long it took me to gather myself to go on. I knew that James T. Green, who was our executive producer for Molten Art, was recording. I was recording on my end with my mic and that I should finish because I'm also trained that the show must go on, that I'm not gonna apologize and say, let me do that again. And in fact, we did it a few times, but of course, each time I teared up differently, but I did. And I tried to get myself the other. And you know, later on, he said, of course I left it in Erica because it was authentic. And that's what this should be. And I think it was his first hint that he was dealing with somebody who I was not, I was gonna be transparent, but I was going to be inside of this space while I was in that space. And I would give myself over to it and I would be with her. I would be with the audience. I would try to feel for them because that's my job. I mean, you know, it's a very powerful and affecting and moving moment in the story that you're telling and where activism of that sort moves from the heady, we're telling you the way that things should be, we're telling you about injustice to emotional response to injustice. Um, it's, it's, it's very powerful and arresting and it's, that sticks with you, you. more than the, the, the statistics about, you know, or the, the pointing out the patterns of racism. Yeah. Black people, I don't know how we're alive. I don't know why we're not crazy in the streets, pulling our hair out. You go on any Instagram and you're greeted with tragedy, rage, violence, injustice. And you're just supposed to go back to your life and eat your food and act like it's nothing happening. And we've done it so much that we've taught ourselves how to do it. We can't. We've got to allow ourselves to lay it down and experience it in the moment unapologetically. My people, um, I'm just uh, in awe of us, our ability to transition. It's amazing. I mean, I've been thinking about that a lot the last few years because now, you know, everything is videoed and sent around and to see all of them and to have, I mean, I think you and I, most black people have probably 25 or 30 videos in our mind. Oh my God. That we could call up on a, on a moment. I could just say a name. You'd be like, yep, I could see him getting killed. Yep. I could see her getting killed. Um, and it's, it's, I'm like, how does, how does it affect a community when we're all walking around with all these videos of black death in our minds, in our short-term memory. Brutal, brutal. I don't know. You, it's a really great thing you're thinking about. And we, I don't know, I don't know. You just said it when you said 20 or 30. If you mentioned when I go, oh yeah, there it is, it would pop up. Oh, is it, oh sure, that. Oh yeah, oh wow, I remember that. I remember even, oh, I said something. Send. This is outrageous. It makes no freaking sense. We're assaulted. Listen, when Martin Luther King died back in the day, I'm sure it played on a loop. You know, the idea of them talking about it all the time. But they didn't see him get shot. Right. We see the people getting shot, knees on necks. We see it all. We see people. There was a man that pulled a little girl out of the car or a young girl. She was hogtied and carried her into the station like that. To me, it haunts me. Why? It haunts me, Philando Castile, 
girlfriend begging, please don't shoot my boyfriend. And the little girl in the back and her saying, mommy, it's okay. Why are we going to check back with her to see who she is? That's the whole point too. Not to just see them when they're gone. Find out how they're doing. See them. What is their life like now? What are their life? It's unreal. These going on and on with black men and they're just supposed to go on and just act, what? It's absurd. Thank you.